UV light, hormonal breakouts, stress and how it affects the skin, supplements that can make acne worse. These are all questions and topics that can have a lot of polarizing thoughts. So today I want to answer them individually, help provide you answers and peace of mind. Welcome back to part two of Ask a Derm instead of Googling, where I grab all your comments from my social media and I answer them here in this series. I'm Dr. Amina. I'm a triple board certified dermatologist and I have been in private practice for over 10 years. I'm a skincare expert. Expert and I love talking all things acne, hyperpigmentation, rosacea, eczema, hair loss. If it's related to the skin, I usually love to talk about it. I'm also a huge proponent at taking a holistic approach to your skin health. So not only looking at what you're putting on your skin, but what you're putting in your body, whether it's diet or supplements, your stress, your sleep, all those factors that can also play a huge role with skin health. All right, but enough about me, let's get into the fun stuff. Are there any supplements that make acne worse? There are supplements out there. Um, one of the first thing that comes to mind is whey protein. And that's more of like a powder, but it's kind of like a supplement that people use when they're working out at the gym. And whey protein, you know, is derived from dairy. And we know that dairy can make acne worse. When it comes to whey protein, we tend to see more inflammatory bumps, kind of deeper cysts and nodules, and they can occur anywhere, but we see them more so on the back. And a lot of times this kind of coincides with men who take like testosterone supplementation, or if anyone's transitioning and they're on testosterone, that can also for sure worsen acne. Well, another supplement that we can see worsen acne, there are actually certain supplements in the vitamin B family. So if people start taking a B complex, they might notice that their acne is getting worse. It's specifically B12. And there are some studies that show that it can worsen acne. And it's not quite sure. I think the bacteria that causes acnes, Cutibacterium acnes, actually uses B12 to function. So, so B12 can almost like feed the bacteria in a way. Uh, vitamin B6 also can play a role. There's a little bit of evidence showing that iodine can play a role. For people who take more B vitamins, I think it could really show up in any form, but I think classically it's more just like small, kind of more monomorphic papules on the face. Some people also think that biotin can make acne worse. There's still very limited data on that, so I don't really talk about that as much with patients. How do you manage stress-related flare-ups? So basically this question was more about how to treat like stress-related skin conditions and we see stress cause things like acne and psoriasis, hair loss, a variety of other things that involve inflammation. And of course we have like medications for those, but I also think it's important to step back and look at how to address the stress in your life. I also go into this in a separate YouTube video, kind of more in depth. So please check that out. But here are just some quick tips and guides that I like to go over. When it comes to relieving stress, obviously you want to make sure that you're getting enough sleep, that you're exercising. Other things that have been found to be helpful for stress, and this is my favorite, is practicing gratitude, which seems might not do a lot, but there are scientific studies that show that gratitude can actually make some physical changes to the body and to the brain, which is really cool. Yeah, I think that's just something simple to do. Just think of five things you're grateful for. If you can do that multiple times a day, even better. Other things is having a community, having people to talk to, friends, family, making sure that you're not going through whatever you're going through alone. And then of course, meditation, which I know meditation can be hard for many people. A lot of people don't even know where to start, but it's just a matter of even like sitting quietly to yourself and just observing your thoughts or observing the sounds that are around you and not getting lost in the chaos in your brain. Another thing that's simple is just practicing slow, deep breaths. There's something that I remember hearing from Dr. Andrew Weil, and my mom's a huge fan of this breathing technique. And I'm sure there's a history to this breathing technique, but I learned about it from Dr. Andrew Weil. It's the four, seven, eight breathing technique where you breathe in for four counts, you hold for seven counts, and you breathe out for eight counts. And I do that at night. It just helps me go to sleep. But like I said, I know we're not therapists, but these are just simple things that I personally like when it comes to treating and managing stress. True or false? Hair grows back thicker after dermaplaning. That's false, but I can understand why people think that happens. Dermaplaning, I mean, it's like shaving your skin. So your hair is getting like shaved off with it. And the baby hairs that we're talking about, these are hairs that have probably never been shaven before. These are probably hairs that you've had for such a long time. So the ends of those hairs are probably tapered because when they first like grew out of your skin, they were like skinny little hairs. And then the base is a little bit wider. So when you're shaving and it's growing in, it's growing in at the same diameter as the base of that hair shaft. So it seems like it's thicker because the hair prior has like a tapered end to it, but the hair is technically not thicker. When are you supposed to see a dermatologist for a skin cancer screening? 
So if you're not sure, anyone is welcome to see a dermatologist, but I typically recommend when you're an adult in your 20s to get a baseline skin check and then a dermatologist can determine how often you need to come back for a skin cancer screening. In terms of who would definitely benefit getting cancer screening regularly, like at least once a year, are people who have had a personal or family history of skin cancer, namely melanoma. The non-melanoma skin cancers certainly are a risk factor, but melanoma we tend to see more of a genetic predisposition with those. And if you've had any really bad like blistering sunburns, especially in your younger years as a kid, as a teenager, that puts you at increased risk for skin cancer, as well as using a tanning bed more than 10 times, which I think a lot of people have done that. <laughs> Other risk factors include having like really, really fair skin with freckles, red hair, green eyes, just that kind of that whole picture. Those people are at risk for skin cancer more than the average person. If you have more than 100 moles, you are at higher risk for developing melanoma, whether it's a new spot that's a melanoma or from one of your pre-existing moles. If you're immunocompromised in any way, like if you're on certain medications that's suppressing your immune system, you are at increased risk. Also, if you've had a history of cancer, whether it's like a solid organ cancer like breast cancer or like a blood cancer like lymphoma or leukemia, you're also at increased risk for skin cancer. Yeah, it's interesting when I did my residency rotation at Georgetown, one of the attendings at the melanoma clinic, he was convinced that people who were lifeguards when they were younger were at much higher risk for getting skin cancer. And then the chair of my department, he was convinced that people who had a lot of moles on their butt we're at higher risk, but that has not been officially proven in the literature. So, you know, we always make sure to look under the underwear to see if you have any suspicious moles there. But that was his theory, which I thought was interesting. If you're younger, if you're like under the age of 20, if you're a kid and you're not sure if you need to get screened by a dermatologist, you're still welcome to see a dermatologist. If there's a suspicious mole or a spot that you're just concerned about, feel free to see a dermatologist and you may need to be seen regularly in your younger years. The dermatologist can tell you whether or not you should come back to check on those moles. Why do I have breakouts around my cycle? This is a common question. So breakouts around your periods is usually related to hormonal fluctuations. So after you ovulate, so two weeks before your period, your progesterone steadily rises. When there are higher levels of progesterone, this can actually increase the production of oil or sebum. And this is what's responsible for clogging your pores, potentially leading to a breakout. And then like right before your period, the progesterone and estrogen levels fall. And the whole time our testosterone levels are like pretty steady. But, you know, in addition to the increasing oil production from the progesterone, if your testosterone levels still remain above the levels of the progesterone and estrogen, especially when they drop, that difference in testosterone can also contribute to the formation of breakouts. So it's interesting with hormonal breakouts, we see it more in adult women. It can be anywhere on the face, but we tend to see it more so on the cheeks and the jawline, like the beard area, neck sometimes chest and back. And these areas have a higher concentration of androgens that are more potent and play a bigger role with contributing to acne formation. It's all about the hormones. And in terms of like why our hormones are so like jacked up, <laughs> It could be so many things. I think stress is playing a really big role. We're seeing like an epidemic of adult acne. And I think stress can send signals to our other hormones, our reproductive hormones, and that can do weird things. Could it be things in our diet? Maybe. Like, could it be related to like other hormone additives in our food? Maybe. People are also concerned about like plastics and plastics having, you know, endocrine disrupting capabilities. So I don't know, there's a lot of potential things happening in our environment. We know that something's going on because there's definitely a rise in like adult female acne along with like other like hormonal issues that we see a lot. Can UV rays still impact the skin at night? UV rays are actually pretty minimal at night. So I wouldn't worry too much about wearing sunscreen outdoors at night. But what's interesting is that you can still get some UV light exposure indoors with certain lights, like fluorescent lights can also have some UV light effect. There was one study that showed that people who were constantly exposed to fluorescent light indoors had a lifetime UV exposure increase by 3%. And I think this becomes a little bit more relevant to people who have kind of more photosensitive conditions like autoimmune issues like lupus or conditions like melasma, which is very sensitive to UV light. 
So I think if you have these conditions that it's important to really wear sunscreen all the time, essentially. When people ask like, do we need to wear sunscreen indoors? I tell them yes, because if you're near a window, you know, you're still exposed to UVA rays through window glass. And a lot of times people still have to step outside to, to run errands or whatnot. But if you're not near a window or if it's dark outside, I think that it's still something to think about. There's also studies showing effects of blue light. So blue light are things that we can see from like TV screen, phones, tablets, and and blue light has been shown to increase the production of free radicals, which are like, you know, unstable molecules that can contribute to aging. And so wearing sunscreen can potentially help protect against that too. Blue light, you know, that's not UV rays, but it's still just another thing that can also affect you know, the aging of the skin. I think in general, it's important to wear sunscreen every day, even if you are staying indoors, but it's gonna be more relevant and more important, especially for those who have photosensitive conditions, like I said, like lupus, or if you have something like melasma, which is also sensitive to heat in addition to UV light. Well, that was a lot of fun. I love being able to help out by answering these questions. So to keep this series going, let me know what questions you want me to include in part three. Be sure to subscribe so you can get an alert next week when I post my next video.